Well, hello. This is the first bonus stream for this game. What is the bonus stream going to be? Well, it's... Eh, it's actually not too... Uh, nothing too crazy. It's just, um... Going through the codex and, uh... Listening to the primary entries and then me reading some of the, uh... Interesting secondary ones. I'm not gonna fucking sit here and tell you all about, um... Uh, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you all about, um, uh, different types of ships and what they mean, but just the interesting stuff. So, let us begin with the Council Races. The Asari were the first species to discover the Citadel. When the Salarians arrived, it was the Asari who proposed the establishment of the Citadel Council to maintain peace throughout the galaxy. Since then, the Asari have served as the mediators and centrists of the Council. An all-female race, the Asari reproduce through a form of parthenogenesis. They can attune their nervous system to that of another individual of any gender and of any species to reproduce. This capability has led to the unseemly and inaccurate rumors about Asari promiscuity. Asari can live for over a thousand years, passing through three stages of life. In the Maiden stage, they wander restlessly, seeking new knowledge and experience. When the Matron stage begins, they meld with interesting partners to produce their offspring. This ends when they reach the Matriarch stage, where they assume the roles of leaders and counselors. So what do you think about that? An all-female race that lives for a thousand years. Iffy? Why is that? They got all the bits. You'll learn more as the game goes on, I'll say that much, when it comes to that specifically, because I know it's brought up. It is brought up. The second species to join the Citadel, the Salarians are warm-blooded amphibians with a hyperactive metabolism. Salarians think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Salarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted. Unfortunately, their metabolic speed leaves them with a relatively short lifespan, Salarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. The Salarians were responsible for advancing the development of the primitive Krogan species to use as soldiers during the Rachni Wars. They were also behind the creation of the Genophage bioweapon the Turians used to quell the Krogan Rebellion several centuries later. Salarians are known for their observational capability and non-linear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage, they are constantly experimenting and inventing, and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. So what do you think of that? A race that, because of how short their lifespans are, they always have to be fast with um, innovations, how they live their lives. And I, I think I mentioned this to you, because it is mentioned later on. Um, men outrank women in Solarian culture 9 to, um, uh, nine to 10. So for every, um, out of, in a group of 10, 9 of those Solarians are going to be male, and only 1 will be female. And because... And because, but, 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 the females have an elevated status because of that. Roughly 1,200 years ago, the Turians were invited to join the Citadel Council to fulfill the role of galactic peacekeepers. The Turians have the largest fleet in Citadel space, and they make up the single largest portion of the Council's military forces. As their territory and influence has spread, the Turians have come to rely on the Salarians for military intelligence and the Asari for diplomacy. Despite a somewhat colonial attitude towards the rest of the galaxy, 
the ruling hierarchy understands they would lose more than they would gain if the other two races were ever removed. Turians come from an autocratic society that values discipline and possesses a strong sense of personal and collective honor. There is lingering animosity between Turians and humans over the First Contact War of 2157, which is known as the Relay 314 incident to the Turians. Officially, however, the two species are allies, and they enjoy civil, if cool, diplomatic relations. So... Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Imagine a war breaking out that was so bad for humanity that they still, like, have lingering hatred for another species, but to the other race, it was just like... A minor battle that they didn't really care enough to uh, think that much upon later on. It's like, yeah, it happened, whatever, get over it. And another interesting thing about Turians, every one of them has to go through mandatory military service for a certain amount of years. So every Turian you meet is a trained soldier. It's like how, um, that's actually what uh, goes on in South Korea, too. After a certain age, you have to join the military for, like, four years, I think? You, you have a mandatory four... And now, the extinct races. 50,000 years ago, the Protheans were the only space-faring species in the galaxy. They vanished in a swift galactic extinction. Only the legacy of their empire remains. They are believed to have built the mass relays and the citadel, which have allowed numerous species to explore and expand throughout the galaxy. Prothean ruins are found on worlds across the galaxy. While surprisingly intact for their age, functioning examples of Prothean paleotechnology are rare. Time and generations of looters have picked their dead cities and derelict stations clean. Some believe the Protheans meddled in the evolution of younger races. The Hanar homeworld of Kaje, for example, shows clear evidence of former Prothean occupation. The presence of a former Prothean observation post on Mars has caused a rebirth of interventionary evolutionists among humans. These individuals believe the god myths of ancient civilizations are misremembered encounters with aliens. So, the Hanar homeworld, the, the jellyfish guys, are li their homeworld is littered with the Prothean ruins and stuff, so they worship them as gods. And on Mars, like you just said, there is a um, there's an archive of Prothean data because apparently they had a post there to observe Earth. And because of that little knowledge, people are now thinking of all like religious stuff that goes on on Earth. As possible interactions with aliens with so Thor Jesus all that shit the Egyptian gods were prop were probably Protheans and now the non council races in the early 2160s the Alliance began aggressive colonization of worlds in the Skillian verge much to the dismay of the Batarians who had been developing the region for several decades in 2171, the Batarians petitioned the Council to declare the Verge a zone of Batarian interest. The Council refused, however, declaring unsettled worlds in the region open to human colonization. In protest, the Batarians closed their Citadel Embassy and severed official diplomatic relations with the Council, effectively becoming a rogue state. They instigated a proxy war in the Verge by funneling money and weapons to criminal organizations urging them to strike at human colonies. Hostilities peaked with the Skillian Blitz of 2176, an attack on the human capital of Elysium by Batarian-funded pirates and slavers. In 2178, the Alliance retaliated with a crushing assault on the moon of Torfin, long used as a staging base by Batarian-backed criminals. In the aftermath, the Batarians retreated into their own systems and are now rarely seen in Citadel space. So, this is something he doesn't mention. The Batarians were always assholes. They didn't just start 
being slavers and, you know, being bad guys as soon as humans came up, they were always kind of bad. It's just when the humans came to take, like, some spots that they were quote-unquote cultivating for their own, like, uh, civilizations, they were like, hey, we were gonna, you know, be on this planet eventually, maybe one day, tomorrow, I don't know. But you gave these planets to the humans, what the fuck? Could be like, dude, come on, you, you guys aren't fucking using these planets. You guys barely do anything for the Citadel to begin with, so of course we're gonna help out the humans. And you know, if they happen to get killed by you guys, yeah, that's, that's none of our business. They don't say that in this. The Elcor are a Citadel species native to the high gravity world Dakuna. They are massive creatures, standing on four muscular legs for increased stability. Elcor moves slowly, an evolved response to an environment where a fall can be lethal. This has colored their psychology, making them deliberate and conservative. Elcor's speech is ponderous and monotone. Among themselves, scent, slight movements, and sub-vocalized infrasound convey shades of meaning that make a human smile seem as subtle as a fireworks display. Since their subtlety can lead to misunderstandings with other species, the Elcor often go out of their way to clarify when they are being sarcastic, amused, or angry. Dakuna's high gravity impedes mountain formation. Most of the world consists of flat, open plains, which prehistoric Elcor wandered across in small family bands. Modern Elcor still prefer open sky and can become restless and uncomfortable on long starship journeys. So they're like this, not just because of culture, but because their fucking planet will crush them to death if they take too bad of a fall, like a trip. It, it always makes me feel bad, because they, they, I feel like they got the biggest short end of the stick in a way, because they move slow, they talk slow, they can't really convey emotion with other races. It, it's just kind of sad, a little bit. The Geth are a humanoid race of networked AIs. They were created by the Quarians 300 years ago as tools of labor and war. When the Geth showed signs of self-evolution, the Quarians attempted to exterminate them. The Geth won the resulting war. This example has led to legal, systematic repression of artificial intelligences in galactic society. The Geth possess a unique distributed intelligence. An individual has rudimentary animal instincts, but as their numbers and proximity increase, the apparent intelligence of each individual improves. In groups, they can reason, analyze situations, and use tactics, as well as any organic race. Geth space is located at the trailing end of the Perseus arm, beyond the lawless Terminus systems. The Perseus veil, an obscuring dark nebula of opaque gas and dust, lies between their space and the Terminus systems. So yeah, I, I, I kind of explained it once before. They were worker robots that were pushed too far once they started to think and basically killed their creators to get the fuck off their their planet now. Not your planet, my planet. And for the most part, they just want to be left alone. So why they're out here attacking uh, other colonies? Who knows? The it's explained are now. a citadel species known for excessive politeness. They speak with scrupulous precision and take offense at improper language. Hanar that expect to deal with other species take special courses to help them unlearn their tendency to take offense at improper speech. All Hanar have two names. The face name is known to the world. The soul name is kept for use among close friends and relations. Hanar never refer to themselves in the first person in conversation with someone they know on a face name basis. To do so is considered egotistical, so instead they refer to themselves as this one, or the impersonal it. Their homeworld, Kajay, has 90% ocean cover and orbits an energetic white star 
resulting in a permanent blanket of cloud. Due to the presence of Prothean ruins on the world, many Hanar worship them, and Hanar myths often speak of an elder race that civilized them by teaching them language. That sounds a lot like, um, fucking, uh... Camino, because Camino also has lots of clouds too. When the Asari discovered the Citadel, they also discovered the Keepers, a docile, multi-limbed insect race that seemingly exists only to maintain and repair the Great Prothean Station. Early attempts to communicate with or study the Keepers were failures, and it is now illegal to interfere with or impede Keeper activity. Because they are completely non-threatening, keepers have become virtually invisible to everyone else. Similarly, they seem indifferent to other species, except for their tendency to help new arrivals integrate themselves into the Citadel. No matter how many keepers die due to old age, violence, or accident, they maintain a constant number. No one has discovered the source of new keepers, but some hypothesize they are genetic constructs, Biological androids created somewhere deep in the inaccessible core of the Citadel itself. So imagine that. They're not even technically alive. They're fucking, like, organic clone robots. It's kind of sad. They have a purpose, but no culture. The Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by predators was still the number one cause of Krogan fatalities. Afterwards, it was death by gunshot. When the Salarians discovered them, the Krogan were a brutal, primitive species, struggling to survive a self-inflicted nuclear winter. The Salarians culturally uplifted them, teaching them to use and build modern technology so they could serve as soldiers in the Rachni War. Liberated from the harsh conditions of their homeworld, the quick-breeding Krogan experienced an unprecedented population explosion. They began to colonize nearby worlds. Even though these worlds were already inhabited, the Krogan rebellions lasted nearly a century, only ending when the Turians unleashed the Genophage, a Salarian-developed bioweapon that crushed all Krogan resistance. The genophage makes only one in a thousand pregnancies viable, and today, the Krogan are a slowly dying breed. Understandably, the Krogan harbor a grudge against all other species, especially the Turians. I know you have thoughts on that. What do you think, now that you have a little more context as to what happened? They saved the galaxy, but they were always violent. They weren't bad, they were just, how do I put it, strong-willed and not willing to back down from a fight. They were taking people's homes from them, from going onto other planets. Yes? Empire? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Their whole stick was just pure numbers. They, they were str actually, yeah, strong and durable numbers. Because each one of them is like a damn tank. It takes a lot to kill one. And they like killing other species and especially each other. Well, that one was more because it, he was on a job. He liked killing him. He's a mercenary. Yes. But, um... Does your thoughts on knowing what their culture is like 
change your perception of the punishment they received? What do you think now, though? Do you think they have the right to cure themselves? Not just a personally, but as a species. This question will be answered, I will say that. In this trilogy, that specific question uh, on uh, whether the Kro Krogan genophage was ethical or not, and if it should be cured, will be answered. And it's a big answer. Driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago, most Quarians now live aboard the migrant fleet, a flotilla of 50,000 vessels ranging in size from passenger shuttles to mobile space stations. Home to 17 million Quarians, the flotilla understandably has scarce resources. Because of this, each Quarian must go on a rite of passage known as the pilgrimage when they come of age. They leave the fleet and only return once they have found something of value they can bring back to their people. Other species tend to look down on the Quarians for creating the Geth and for the negative impact their fleet has when it enters a system. This has led to many myths and rumors about the Quarians, including the belief that underneath their clothes and breathing masks, they are actually cybernetic creatures, a combination of organic and synthetic parts. That is not true. They are organic species. It's just if they get out of those suits, they will get sick and die. The Volus are a member species of the Citadel with their own embassy but they are also a client race of the Turians. Centuries ago, they were voluntarily absorbed into the hierarchy, effectively trading their mercantile prowess for Turian military protection. Erun, their homeworld, lies far beyond the normal life zone of its star. However, the world has a high-pressure greenhouse atmosphere that traps enough heat to support an ammonia-based biochemistry. As a result, the Volus must wear pressure suits and breathers when dealing with other species, as conventional nitrogen-oxygen-air mixtures are poisonous to them, and in the low-pressure atmospheres tolerable to most species, their flesh will actually split open. Volus culture is tribal, bartering lands and even people to gain status. This culture of exchange inclines them to economic pursuits. It was the Volus who authored the Unified Banking Act, and they continue to monitor and balance the Citadel economy. So, for the Volus, it's not that they get sick and die, it's that if they leave their suits not on their home world, they will just straight up die horrible deaths. By, you know, bleeding from their eyes or their skin peeling off their body like a banana. Non-sapient creatures. So like animals and stuff. After the Geth secure a location, they round up and impale dead and living bodies on mechanical spikes. The spikes rapidly transform these victims into withered husks, extracting water and trace minerals, and replacing them with cybernetics. The cybernetics reanimate the lifeless flesh and tissue, transforming the bodies into mindless killing machines. Some Alliance soldiers refer to the husk-generating spikes as dragon's teeth, a reference to the mythological berserkers who sprang up from the earth wherever the teeth of the dragon Eris were planted. Dragon's teeth and husks bear little resemblance to other pieces of Geth technology. No one is sure why a synthetic race would bother to drain the minuscule amount of recoverable resources from organic corpses, though the value of reusing them as shock troops is obvious. So, believe it or not, this is... I'm, I'm gonna say this. It's a hint at something to come. This is not a Geth invention. 
This is something else that they got from. Who that something is, or what that something is, you'll just have to wait and see. The Citadel is an ancient deep space station, presumably constructed by the Protheans. Since the Prothean extinction, numerous species have come to call the Citadel home. It serves as the political, cultural, and financial capital of the galactic community. To represent their interests, most species maintain embassies on the Presidium, the Citadel's inner ring. The Citadel Tower in the center of the Presidium holds the Citadel Council Chambers. Council affairs often have far-reaching effects on the rest of the galactic community. Five arms, known as the Wards, extend from the Presidium. Their inner surfaces have been built into cities, populated by millions of inhabitants from across the galaxy. The Citadel is virtually indestructible. If attacked, the station can close its arms to form a solid, impregnable shell. For as long as the station has existed, an enigmatic race called the Keepers has maintained it. I'm gonna skip the Citadel Council because it's not that interesting. Just know that they're basically like the, uh, the senators, the presidents of the, uh, the political stuff going on. Spectres are agents from the Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance and answer only to the Citadel Council. They are elite military operatives, granted the authority to deal with threats to peace and stability in whatever way they deem necessary. They operate independently or in groups of two or three. Some are empathetic peacekeepers, resolving disputes through diplomacy. Others are cold-blooded assassins, ruthlessly dispatching problem individuals. All get the job done one way or another, often operating outside the bounds of galactic law. The Spectres were founded after the Salarians joined the Council. For many years, they operated in secrecy as backroom problem solvers. Only after the Krogan rebellions did their activities become publicized. Assignment of a Spectre is less contentious than a military deployment, but makes it clear that the Council is concerned about a situation. Uh, ooh. Okay, Humanity and the Systems Alliance. Humanity's first contact with an alien race occurred in 2157. At that time, the Alliance allowed survey fleets to activate any dormant mass relays discovered, a practice considered dangerous and irresponsible by Council-aligned races. When a Turian patrol discovered a human fleet attempting to activate a relay, they attacked. One human vessel survived, retreating to the colony of Shanxi. The Turians followed, quickly defeating the local forces. Shanxi was occupied, the first and to date only human world to be conquered by an alien species. The Turians believed the handful of ships they defeated represented the bulk of human defenses. So they were unprepared when the second fleet, under Admiral Castany Drescher, launched a strong counteroffensive, evicting them from Shanxi. The Turians mobilized for full-scale war drawing the attention of the rest of the galaxy. The Council quickly intervened, forcing a truce. Fortunately for humanity, the first contact war was ended with a diplomatic solution. Hmm, so yeah. They destroyed a bunch of ships, killed a lot of people, took over a planet, and humanity is rightfully still pissed about it because of the attitudes uh, other species have towards this event. The Systems Alliance is an independent supranational government representing the interests of humanity as a whole. The Alliance is responsible for the governance and defense of all extrasolar colonies and stations. The Alliance grew out of the various national space programs as a matter of practicality. Saul's planets had been explored and exploited through piecemeal national efforts. The expense of colonizing entire new solar systems could not be met by any one country. With humans knowing that alien contact was inevitable, there was enough political will to jointly fund an international effort. Still, the Alliance was often disregarded by those on Earth until the first contact war. While the national governments dithered and bickered over who should lead the effort to liberate Shanxi, the Alliance fleet struck decisively. 
Post-war public approval gave the Alliance the credibility to establish its own parliament and become the galactic face of humanity. So the Systems Alliance is basically all the governments of humanity into one now. They didn't have a lot of um, power at first because it was just a bunch of country space programs with a few military stuff here and there. But after the second fleet kicked the Turians' asses in the first contact war, they were basically like, fuck dude, we're done, just, just take it, you, you guys win. So technically no more Amer- like North America- like the country still exists, it's just America and like Canada technically don't exist anymore because they're all one now. That is something that happens a lot in sci-fi where either um, the governments of the world are all still separate or they all come together as one. You think that'll happen? Or do you, th or do you think we'll still be separate in the future? Yeah, it's fair. I, that's something I kind of believe in too. I think, I think we are too petty as a species to truly come together. Pharos is a habitable world in the Uh, actually, hold on. I'm gonna do Pharos. these when we go to the systems itself. So, Pharos, Pharos no. and Novaria, when we get on the planets, is when I'll play them. I'll remember this. But there is two here that I will play. The Terminus systems are located on the far side of the Attican Traverse, beyond the space administered by the Citadel Council or claimed by the Human Systems Alliance. It is populated by a loose affiliation of minor species, united only in their refusal to acknowledge the political authority of the Council or adhere to the Citadel Conventions. Their independence comes at a price. The Terminus is fraught with conflict. War among the various species is common, as governments and dictators constantly rise and fall. The region is a haven for illegal activities, particularly piracy and the slave trade. At least once a year, a fleet from the Terminus invades the nearby Attican Traverse. These attacks are typically small raids against poorly defended colonies. The Council rarely retaliates, as sending patrols into the Terminus systems could unify the disparate species against their common foe, triggering a long and costly war. I'd have to look up which species live out there, but... The, for sure, the Batarians are one, and they're fucking pirates and slavers. I want to say the Krogan are another, but I have to double check on that. There are uh, other alien races out there, but I'll, like I said, I'll check on it later on. In Uncharted Worlds, I don't have to tell you what an Uncharted World is, do I? It's a world that's not really explored. The Mako Infantry Fighting Vehicle was designed for the System Alliance's frigates. Though the uh, I'm not gonna show that one. Or it's basically our tank. When we go out to certain areas, this is what we go into. The Mako Infantry Fighting Vehicle was eh, designed you know what, for I'll the System Alliance's out. frigates. It's it's just Though one the entry. The interior is cramped. An M35 is small enough to be carried in the cargo bay and easily deployed on virtually any world. With its turreted 155mm mass accelerator and coaxially mounted machine gun, the Mako can provide a fire team with weapon support as well as mobility. Since Alliance Marines may be required to fight on any world, the Mako is environmentally sealed and equipped with microthrusters for use on low gravity planetoids. The Mako is powered by a sealed hydrogen-oxygen fuel cell and includes a small Element Zero core. While not large enough to nullify the vehicle's mass, the core can reduce it enough to be safely airdropped. When used in conjunction with thrusters, it also allows the Mako to extricate itself from difficult terrain. So this is something that's, that's a little interesting to talk about. This series has had an issue with vehicles and has never gotten them right. 
they've had to redesign vehicles at least three times. The Mako being the first attempt. The second one gets a vehicle, but it's rarely used. And they don't try vehicles again until the spin-off game Andromeda, which didn't drop until like 2016, 20... A long time ago for, for you and me right now. So what is that? What do I mean by that? Vehicles are not going to be fun in this game. It might be funny though. There's going to be some funny moments, I'll say that much. Biotics is the ability of rare individuals to manipulate dark energy and create mass effect fields through the use of electrical impulses from the brain. Intense training and surgically implanted amplifiers are necessary for a biotic to produce mass effect fields powerful enough for practical use. The relative strength of biotic abilities varies greatly among species and with each individual. There are three branches of biotics. Telekinesis uses mass lowering fields to levitate or impel objects. Mass raising kinetic fields are used to block or pin objects. Spatial distortion uses rapidly shifting mass fields to shred objects. Most organic species are capable of developing biotic abilities, though there are risks involved. Biotics are the result of an in utero exposure to element zero. This usually causes fatal cancers in the victim, but in rare cases, it coalesces into nodules within the fetus's developing nervous system. So, to be a biotic, you have to be exposed to it before you're born. Basically, they would have to cut you open when you're pregnant and basically put what the equivalent of a of radiation inside of you so your baby can be uh, a tele a, a superpowers pretty much and there is chance for cancer and other horrible horrible diseases one of them being you go insane and that's not you that's your baby that gets cancer So, virtual intelligence, virtual intelligence is an advanced form of user interface software. VIs use a variety of methods to simulate natural. I don't have to tell you what a VI is. I already told you. It's basically your Siri, your fucking Alexa. We have that right now. But when subjected to an electrical current, the rare material dubbed element zero or ESO emits a dark energy field that raises or lowers the mass of all objects within it. This mass effect is used in countless ways, he said it. from generating artificial gravity to manufacturing high-strength construction materials. It is most prominently used I'm gonna to enable say it faster every time than light it. space travel. ESO is generated when solid matter, such as a planet, is affected Ow. by the energy of a the star going done. supernova. The material is common in the asteroid debris that orbits neutron stars and pulsars. These are dangerous places to mine, requiring extensive use of robotics, telepresence, and shielding to survive the incredible radiation from the dead star. Only a few major corporations can afford the setup costs required to work these primary sources. Humanity discovered refined element zero at the Prothean Research Station on Mars allowing them to create mass effect fields and develop FTL travel. So this is the shit they put into you when they do biotics. The stuff orbiting fucking <laughs> dying s stars that can change the mass of something making it heavier or lighter. Element zero can increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space-time when subjected to an electrical current. With a positive current, mass is increased. With a negative current, mass is decreased. The stronger the current, the greater the magnitude of the dark energy mass effect. In space, low mass fields allow FTL travel and inexpensive surface-to-orbit transit. High mass fields create artificial gravity and push space debris away from vessels. In manufacturing, 
Low mass fields permit the creation of evenly blended alloys, while high mass compaction creates dense, sturdy construction materials. The military makes extensive use of mobility enhancing technologies, with mass effect utilizing fighting vehicles standard frontline issue in most military forces. Mass effect fields are also essential in the creation of kinetic barriers or shields to protect against enemy fire. So the science behind it basically makes spaceships happen. That's the only thing you really need to know from it. Spaceships and superpowers. Combat hard suits use a dual layer system to protect the weapon. Uh... The kinetic barrier. All modern infantry weapons. Combat okay, uh, I'm not going to do the, the body armor or the barriers because that's kind of self-explanatory. The weapons, it's where it gets interesting. Com all modern infantry weapons from pistols to assault rifles use micro-scaled mass accelerator technology. Projectiles consist of tiny metal slugs suspended within a mass-reducing field, accelerated by magnetic force to speeds that inflict kinetic damage. The ammo magazine is a simple block of metal. The gun's internal computer calculates the mass needed to reach the target based on distance, gravity, and atmospheric pressure, then shears off an appropriate sized slug from the block. A single block can supply thousands of rounds, making ammo a non-issue during any engagement. Top-line weapons also feature smart targeting that allows them to correct for weather and environment. Firing on a target in a howling gale feels the same as it does on a calm day at the practice range. Smart targeting does not mean a bullet will automatically find the mark every time the trigger is pulled. It only makes it easier for the marksman to aim. So guns in the future are basically mostly idiot proof and unlimited ammo. It's a very frightening idea to some people. Um, I'm not going to read all of this because it's a lot, but um, I'll read the interesting stuff. Or maybe I'll save it for another day. Let me just see what's in here. You know what? I think I'll end it there. A lot of the other stuff um, I'll probably do for another stream where I'll actually read stuff aloud. But from now on, I'm going to try to, how you say, as the entries come up, just let them play. At least the ones that have voice. The unvoiced ones, I'll probably play them for the another bonus stream. But yeah, th th that's it. This is the stream. Um, this is m one just wanted to get out of the way. So when I do the stream tomorrow, it's just story, characters, and action. Any closing thoughts? Ah, that's the point. You put this on when you're wanting to clock out or take a little nap. Just listen to me ramble on, or the uh, computer man speak. You can always put the song when you want to fall asleep later on. Learn something and take a nap. But anyways, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to my beautiful wife for always being here. And Z Cat for being here too. And I will probably see everyone tomorrow. Alright, thank you all for coming and goodbye.